Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So today I'm very excited to host Arindam. So where we will have uh, discussions around data science and also about his uh, new book, which is Pythonic AI. So quite excited to see that book when Arindam launched. So I, I got back to him and asked if he can give an interview and, and talk about his book. So quite excited to host Arindam here in this uh, session where we will generally discuss about data science and also about his book and few ad recent advances in the AI uh, side. Right. So Arindam, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Aritra. Um, so I'm a professional in the field of uh, data science uh, and artificial intelligence, and I have uh, 13 plus years of experience uh, in software industry. Um, currently, I'm associated with the EYGDS, uh, where I work as a senior data scientist, and uh, my job is to turn uh, raw data into products, actionable insights, and uh, meaningful stories. Right. Uh, previously, I've been associated with um, Ericsson, Alcatel Lucent, and TCS. Um, in my academics, I completed my MTech in computer science and engineering from Valor Institute of Technology, Valor, and uh, BE in electronics and telecom from Nagpur University. Uh, I filed nine patents till now, five of which have been granted and uh, published 15 plus uh, papers in international journals and conferences. So that's the brief about my background. Yeah, great, Arindam. So that's a such a rich background. So we are starting our discussion on data science for the first time, and it's glad to have you here. So Arindam, uh, how we will generally frame this discussion is around, first of all, we will talk about like how your journey is on data science so far and how it is going so far how, and how it started from the beginning, right? So that will be like, okay. uh, so my, uh, the YouTubers, which like the followers, which listens to my YouTube channel, they are basically newbie. So some yeah. advice to them from your side, how they can start their data science journey. Mm -hmm. With that, we will start. And then we will move to your uh, discussions around the book, which will be the main focus area for this uh, session where we will discuss about what, the, what are the chapters and very much in detail. And then in the last, we will talk about few of the recent advice advances in the data science field. And I would like to take your opinion on that. Yeah, that sounds sure, good. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so, yeah. so to start, like Karindam, if you can just tell our audience like how your data science go journey got started and what motivated you and how is the journey so far? Okay. So my data science journey started uh, when I was studying MTech. Um, so data science or <clears throat> the term data science was not coined uh, back in that time. It was about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And these things are not new. So we already had this in a, in curriculum of computer science since long. Uh, but only thing is that we didn't have enough, uh, you know, the support from the programming language or frameworks or APIs uh, to develop some things um, in practical. Okay, so uh, it was all in theoretical form. Uh, there were not many APIs or libraries available. Um, I started doing some interesting uh, hands-on uh, first from the course of machine learning uh, delivered by Andrew NG through Coursera. Yeah. And uh, that version of the course was uh, taught in MATLAB. Yeah. Right. So that was uh, one of the very first courses on Coursera, probably was developed in 2011, uh, if I'm not wrong. Right. And uh, so now the problem with MATLAB is MATLAB is good and MATLAB is widely used in auto industry, manufacturing industry, mm. uh, aerospace, uh, like that. But um, talking of IT and software industry, it's uh, a bit difficult to develop production ready software in MATLAB because you may not get uh, a complete team. Uh, who know um, where everyone knows MATLAB, like, like developers, the testers, or uh, DevOps guys. So uh, so that, that was one of the problems. Uh, but um, okay, and apart from this course, another course was there like Analytics Edge, which is from MIT, and uh, it was on EDX. Right. So that was also a very uh, crucial course that helped me to uh, to jumpstart my journey in data science. 
or analytics in that sense. And uh, it was taught in R. So R was the language that I had to learn it was, uh, next uh, after the MATLAB for the data science. Yeah. And uh, then gradually this uh, Python libraries used to come and uh, um, I started learning um, scikit-learn, using scikit-learn, then uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and this these things. So these things are quite matured. Now we're going to do many things, uh, uh, be it uh, with tabular data, be it with unstructured data. Um, yeah, so now I work mostly with Python. Almost, almost uh, every project or almost every work that I do is in Python. And uh, but learning is a continuous process. So that is right. uh, though I started with MATLAB and R, but uh, uh, right now this field is uh, moving so fast that it, every day is a learning, and um, you'll have to keep on with the pace. So right. that, that's how it started. Yeah, that's how I'm continuing. Great, great. Yeah. So sometimes like uh, the new things which keep on coming every week, that can mm -hmm. be overwhelming. But I also feel like that is kind of what makes the data science field interesting that you have always right, right. new things to explore and new it, things. It, it, will, it, it will never get bored. Like if <laughs> every day will have right. to, uh, it will have something to learn. Again, if I, if right. I take a leave of seven days, then after right. for, the, for the whole seven days, if I don't do something, then right. after that, I feel, uh, okay, what happened? Like, so many new things have come. Right. So it's like that. Great, great. So, nice journey, Arindam. So, uh, like, for our newbies, right, which are mm -hmm. uh, particularly who are starting their data science journey, and from your experience, if you have to start your data science journey again from scratch, like, I remember, like, when I started my data science journey, like, I used to learn something, then I again used to find that, yeah, I don't know this part, then again, again I have to go back to that, that thing. So it was not kind of a, a focused learning or kind of a plan which I had that time. And that time, the um, uh, materials are also quite less. So right. what's your suggestion, like, if you have to start your journey fresh, how you do, uh, like, advise a newbie to start and what would be the learning path for them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. What you said that uh, when we started, uh, the materials were less, and nowadays you have lots of materials. Like you just open mm. the internet, and there are videos, blogs, uh, LinkedIn posts. There are <clears throat> so many things. Um, the thing is that uh, the good thing is we have internet. The bad thing is we have internet. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's kind of uh, information overload. Okay. Right. Uh, like you also publish videos like on YouTube. So there, there is a structured learning I can see in your videos. Like it's a mm. kind of a playlist. Okay. But uh, if you follow just one video or uh, next you jump to some other video by some other YouTuber, then it will be like uh, scattered learning. Like you don't have any path or you don't have. So instead, if you follow some playlist uh, for a single YouTuber uh, like you or uh, if you follow a book, so that would be more structured. So if I had to start start today uh, again so i will emphasize on a uh, structured learning mm. like instead of uh, moving from here to there and uh, going through many videos i would say that follow a single playlist or a single pay a single book or a single course where uh, there will be a structured learning part and in-depth co coverage right that is one thing and uh, again i will emphasize more on hands-on uh, because uh, knowing something is uh, fine like i used to when i started it was mostly theoretical so i i studied maths i studied uh, the theoretical part of the algorithms but until unless you were uh, deploying them you were implementing them you don't know right. the limitations you don't know how to tackle them right so that is second and uh, third is uh, open source development so nowadays there are so many open source that good thing is most of the uh, software is related to data science and ai field uh, Fairs are open source, be it PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, Python itself, Pandas, NumPy. So every, everything is uh, open source, right? So if you are involved in um, you know, one of them, like if you are contributing for the development of one of them, so the, it will be a nice learning for you as well as uh, uh, you will get exposure to what some of the world's most uh, sort of the developers and uh, hmm. they will check your code. They will give you feedback. So it's a nice uh, learning experience. And right. the final thing I think is uh, reading the paper, uh, research paper. So the field is very fast. It's moving very fast. And uh, hmm. uh, every day few new, new things are coming up. So sometimes uh, you may feel confused or overwhelmed with the things that are coming up in your path. So take hmm. some uh, good research paper that is... Uh, 
everybody is talking about. So, for example, um, if I say, if, um, if, if you want to know about attention or transformer, you can take the best paper, you know what it, what it is. And also, if you don't understand from the paper, so you can take help from the supportive blogs or YouTube videos mm -hmm. for better understanding. Uh, like if I start with the attention is all you need paper. Right. And if I don't understand everything, so I will go to Jay Alamar's blog, the Illustrated Transformer, right. and try to understand it in a better way. So yeah, that's that's how I will I will approach right so that's quite interesting like you mentioned like follow a structured learning path uh, yes then like open source contributions which are like which will give you the new visa kind of a visibility in the in this right. new field right and also like going through the papers which are recently published or any of the famous paper which has a huge impact in the data science field yes. right and so i know like you have done like a few of the open source contributions right Mm -hmm. So if you can just talk about for our uh, viewers. Yeah. So my open source uh, contribution started not from uh, AI part, but in general, the software development in 2014, I joined uh, Google Summer of Code and that was my first uh, exposure open source development. Uh, mm. Then I uh, really... Uh, developed some of the open source because most of the involvement so it is uh, very easy for the beginners especially if you are a college students and um, college students generally say that uh, how can I get a job I am fresher I don't have experience I think instead if you got started developing from your maybe you can start from your first year or second year or whatever so I, I know people who started open source development at very early stage in their college journey and uh, then ended up uh, job at uh, very good institutions like organizations like uh, h2o or hugging phase right. like that yeah so uh, nowadays uh, i don't get much time for open source development but i very much uh, encourage others uh, who are at least at the early stage of mm. the career to do this um, i did some uh, some of the uh, pools in um, pytorch and tensorflow in earlier days uh, but not much today yeah. Okay. okay. So that's a, that's a, something I miss, but um, I will definitely encourage others who are at least uh, right. at the very early stage of career to do so, to take this path. It's definitely it's worth uh, spending your time and effort. Right. Right. So, yeah, that's uh, nice. So, Arindam, let's talk about your book. So, quite excited to talk about that. And I know this feeling of publishing a new book. So, uh, I also published a book. So, yeah, but yeah. yeah, this is a nice feeling and it's like something like your baby, right? You created the yes. whole thing and you designed and there are a lot of iterations which goes on with the publisher, right? You write something, then they come back with feedback. So, it's not an easy thing to do. And uh, I, I remember like when I wrote that book, uh, like uh, Reinforcement Learning Workshop. So, I felt like I was not totally aware of this plagiarism so i kind of copied yeah. my blog thing and i thought like it's mm. the content which i created so i can put it in yeah. my book right so it was kind of a self plagiarism which mm -hmm. they uh, come up with and then i had to change again the content so yeah that's quite a journey so i uh, just wanted to talk about your book it's like pythonic ai a beginner's guide to building ai applications in python right so do you have yeah, the copy yeah. of that book would you like to show that yeah, I, I have a copy. So this is this is the author's copy I received a few days back, and uh, right. it was uh, published uh, two weeks back. Okay. Um, okay. So, so if you can tell me more about this book, how it got started, and what motivated you to write this book, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, th this book, this Pythonic AI, a beginner's guide to building AI applications in Python. It's a book that teaches you how to build AI models using Python. Like Python is almost the de facto of, uh, programming language nowadays. Uh, I would say that R is dead or uh, any other language is dead. I would say that. But Python okay. is something that is widely accepted that we should also accept. So this book is uh, entirely on Python and it includes uh, lots of hands-on projects. So what I, what I felt um uh, lately in my career that if i again this that question that i answered previously that if i had to start again so i would definitely emphasize more on hands-on so without hands-on it's uh, it has uh, your, your ai knowledge has almost no use if i right. if, if you are going to uh, be an ai engineer or data scientist or machine learning engineer whatever way you call it and um, 
hands-on is very, very important. So it includes several hands-on projects that walk you through different uh, AI applications. Uh, mm. And uh, it will also explain you concepts like uh, neural networks, uh, the computer vision, natural language processing, and generative models. So uh, if you are a newbie or uh, if you want to start you if you want to start your journey in ai so this book can help you to go through from simple simple things uh, simple concepts to the more complex mm -hmm. uh, concepts okay uh, each book reiterates and reinforces the important aspects of python scripting and you will learn python coding and how it can be used to build the cutting edge ai applications Okay. Right. So the intention was to develop something where the, it's like uh, learning AI the hard way. Okay. It's not the easy right. way. It's the hard way. Right. So uh, make your hand dirty, store uh -huh. it. And uh, if you want to be an AI expert in 2023, you mm. must know building the models using the available libraries and APIs, be it TensorFlow, right. be it PyTorch. So these APIs are quite mature today. So no hands-on, no learning. So that's what right. the motivation was. Right. Yeah. So I also feel the same. Like you, you, if you go through the theories, it's a never ending thing, right? You keep on right, learning right. things. You feel yes. good that I'm learning the math and all. But when you jump mm -hmm. to the real world applications, like which we, we work in the industry, there we need right. the hands on work, right? And yeah. that time, if you don't have the hands on experience, or if you haven't done the hands on work, that time you lack confidence. I think this book will right. Uh, generally help us in that field or the newbies mm -hmm. so i think you talked about the newbies like uh, uh, can mm -hmm. you put more emphasis like who are the target audience for this book yeah uh, newbies uh, doesn't mean that uh, it should be only college students or uh, someone who are just starting their uh, career it can be mm -hmm. a beginner learner who wants to start the journey in ai okay or any intermediate learner who wants to upskill himself or herself so mm. not only for college students, but a seasoned professional who are looking for, who is looking for mm. uh, making the first step in AI. So right. anyone can benefit from it. So this is for um, anyone and everyone. So whoever wants to upskill. Right, right. Right. So, so if you can talk about uh, the chapters in the book, like if you can go open your book and tell us what are the chapters yeah, sure. that are available and, and just give an overview of each of the chapters. I think that can... Like that yeah, can sure, be helpful sure. for us. So there are total 14 chapters in this uh -huh. book. Okay. And uh, I started from very basic. Like if, if, if you, if you know Python if, or if you don't know Python, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. So if you have some uh, prior experience in Python, but maybe you are not confident enough uh, or you don't know about Python at all. So you can mm -hmm. start from the first chapter because first chapter covers the, it's a kind of Python Kickstarter. Okay. So okay. the basic concepts, libraries and coding. So Python is a, uh, general purpose programming language you can, you can develop ai applications you can develop web applications you can develop automations right. so you can do anything uh, with python uh, but i covered the part which are necessary for developing the data products or ai products okay so mm -hmm. it's very concise way of learning the python for ai and you can start from the first chapter the second one is uh, setting up ai lab so this is the problem i think you also agree that uh, now it is uh, doing the hands on the most uh, difficult part is uh, getting a proper lab uh, you right. don't have uh, gpu access in your personal laptop or uh, yeah. you may not be able to handle large amount of data so right. what i chose that uh, if you can if you can use some uh, freely available cloud infrastructure for example uh, google colab okay so it would be beneficial for the beginners so you can get a certain amount of space there uh, to store your data you get a free gpu access uh, right. right so setting up ai lab is the second chapter where you get to use how to you how to you will get to know how to use google colab for your project mm. uh, how we can connect it uh, with your google drive how we can connect it to your Google GitHub profile like that. Oh. Uh, then the third chapter starts with uh, developing your neural network model. So it's all about neural networks, the theoretical background. Mm. Uh, um, okay, you, you cannot escape theory anyway, so you'll have to know something about right. it. Then you can jump into the uh, hands-on. So basically, it's that part. So some some part of what is what is the uh, intention, what is the developing uh, a neural network kind of infrastructure, the neural network kind of model and its structure, its activation functions, the backpropagation briefly, backpropagation mm. loss functions and optimizers. Uh, here also we developed um, a basic project and then 
going to the fourth chapter it is about the cnn the convolution near convolution and neural network so we are moving uh, from basic python and basic neural network to uh, the vision part computer vision part right so it's again about uh, using uh, tensorflow for building the cnn uh, kind of architectures okay, okay. and um, this kind of concepts can also be used for PyTorch. So I just chose TensorFlow because of some certain reasons, but it can be for PyTorch also if you're a PyTorch fan or if you're a TensorFlow fan, it doesn't mm. matter. So just basic concepts and how to do these things uh, in a proper Pythonic way. So that's mm. what we discussed here and about some standard uh, CNN architecture like ResNet, like uh, uh, AlexNet, VGGNet, like that. Right. So from basic, basic to advanced uh, architectures. Then uh, the image, then then CNN based image classifier. So it's the again image classification and uh, how we can use the VGG kind of architecture or ResNet kind of architecture for image classification kind uh, jobs. There was hands on the experiences there. The sixth chapter is about object detection models. So again, it's the advanced part of the computer vision. So where right. you don't have to only uh, do the classification, but also will have to learn the localization of the object. Right. So there are uh, uh, models like Yono, uh, RCNN, or SSD. So these are the uh, these are the things right. that are covered in this chapter. The seventh one is about the text and image reader. It's about developing the OCR kind of applications in okay. uh, in TensorFlow uh, in Python. Then we are moving to the natural language processing. Now natural language processing is the uh, most uh, widely used, I think, uh, nowadays right. about after Chat GPT and all. But we should know that we cannot directly use like large language models uh, in our text data. We'll have to first start uh, from the cleaning of the text data and right. uh, converting it into a machine understandable form. So this chapter eight, eight chapter starts from the uh, exploring NLP and the advanced concepts about embeddings uh, or you would have the libraries like Glove, how we can use those things for generating the embeddings and all. Then uh, I move to sequence models. Of course, the okay. sequence models is the backbone of your attention. Yeah. And attention is the backbone of transformer. Transformer is the backbone of LLM. <laughs> so uh, this, this hierarchy is there, right? So sequence model, RNN, LSTM, normal uh, things. So get it recurrent units like that. And then, then how to use this sequence model for text classification. So that was the about the 10th chapter. So yeah. basics uh, and also one dimensional CNN, I also included that. Okay. Um, then the 11th chapter is about the attention and transformer models. So from sequence model, we are moving to attention models and then transformer. Right. Then there's briefly LLMs are discussed, but LLM is something that uh, you may not do some uh, the training part as a beginner, you may not perform the beginner training part on right. Google Colab or maybe on your personal laptop. So hmm. do not cover much about the advanced part of the LLM as of now. And the uh, 12th chapter is about generating captions from images. That is the multimodal AI. So you have the image, you have the natural language and you, how we can deal with that. Uh, then the 13th one is the GAN, G-A-N. So it is about the generative models, and the fourteenth one is the is the conditional generative adversarial networks. So it's the CGAN. So that's okay. how the chapters are placed from simple concept to come more complex um, towards the end. Right, sounds great. Like a lot of content to go through. Like, and each of the chapter has certain uh, theory part. After that, you start the coding, yes. or it's only uh, mainly focused on the coding. No, mo mostly uh, a bit about theory, about background, because some terminologies you may not understand if you just uh, right. jump into the programming, like what is backpropagation, mm. okay? What is um, optimizer? What is activation function? Right. So you don't understand. Uh, you may not get understand how how the LSTM is different from the vanilla RNN. So you may not understand uh, if you directly jump into coding, because in the coding, the these things are abstracts. Like if you are using uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch, you don't know that uh, mm. what is the underlying architecture or uh, algorithm, right? Uh, how RNA is working there. So from basic understanding of the algorithms and then uh, we jumped Great. into the program. Great, and I think you also talked about the LLM, right? There is a chapter which yeah. is associated with LLM. So if you can yeah. give some uh, things, some insights, like which model you have used in that chapter and how you structured the book for that particular chapter. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that chapter is uh, okay. So we started uh, from attention, and that chapter is mostly on attention and transformers. Okay, okay. so those models are uh, discussed. Um, like how, first of all, why attention is needed? So attention is mm. a very groundbreaking uh, invention, I would say. That uh, yeah. RN was there, LSTM was there for long, uh, but attention when it came, uh, it was like uh, looking at. Um, a natural looking at the natural text from a different point of view, like how much attention you should put for different uh, components of a, a sentence and uh, so on. Right. So we discussed in detail about attention and also from the scratch how how you can design an attention network, attention based oh. network. Then okay. uh, jumped into uh, again. Uh, transformers architecture and how we can so there are there are transformers models in hugging face you can directly right. use but yeah. if you want to develop something from the scratch like using the call type function in tensorflow and mm. uh, uh, if you want to write your own uh, you can you, you can customize it in any way right so right. so that customization has been shown and briefly i introduced the llm part and how to use the open ai based apis oh, okay. uh, i did not uh, yeah so that, that that is the part that, that is that is required for the beginners like unless uh, until you get a uh, good uh, hold on good hands on in uh, transformers right. and uh, this kind of architectures you cannot go further with like lang chains and all these things are quite uh, advanced topics so i didn't right. cover those things in this yeah. uh, in this uh, yeah this is already like you already mentioned in that's a beginner guide like that's it's a kickstart yeah, yeah. if you want to kickstart your journey this is the place to right, be right right quite yeah. quite uh, impressive in them so like starting from basics of neural network till you go to llm and gan so it you covered a whole range of horizon in this field and i feel like uh, it's it's quite interesting right and uh, so quickly i will ask you like which chapter you find that that is the most interesting uh, most like you enjoyed writing the most okay so uh, i enjoyed writing um all the chapters in that sense uh, i had to put a lot of effort uh, but the main challenge was i would say that um, choosing the right use case because uh, i had to keep right. in mind constantly that uh, the person the target audience for this book so if i mm. if i choose some um, and of course uh, there is a page limit so i'll had to um, i had to complete something within a certain right. amount of pages right so if, uh, when i when i start a new concept i had to choose uh, um Maybe I, I in some chapters I I did some base like standard data sets uh, like cipher or uh, right. the, uh, yeah and the digit recognition A to Z data sets like that right. yeah MNIST data sets and extended part of the MNIST MNIST right. so uh, those were there and in some chapters there are uh, you know some data sets which are not so standardized so you have to do uh, you'll have to do lots of cleaning because uh, learning AI is not only about ai models it's also the data processing and you right. know you will agree also that 80 percent of your time will right. go for cleaning the data and making the data suitable for the ai models because once you once you have the clean data once you have everything at hand so it's just like uh, writing the model and uh, keep it running Right. So uh, it it don't be a bit diff it, it it would be a bit difficult if you don't know how to clean the data or process Absolutely. the data for yeah. the you know, beneficial of your model. So that's why in the later chapters uh, towards the end of the book uh, when I started doing the uh, I started introducing the complex concepts. So the uh, you, you, one one can see that the data sets uh, have also changed from basic standard data sets to some complex data sets. Okay. But you can download it easily. So the data sets are openly available. So it's uh, mm. um, licensed to be used by anyone. Uh, but you will have to download and you'll have to do lots of cleaning. And for that cleaning purpose, you'll also have some helper functions. So those helper functions are also written. So you will have to write your own helper functions. It is not like are generally given by someone else right so uh, so that kind of challenges i faced uh, otherwise i enjoyed uh, every every chapter uh, writing about every chapter uh, but um, those are the challenges uh, so later chapters uh, later chapter the chapters are a bit complex um, i had to do put uh, much effort on that uh, uh, okay. but yeah. really enjoyed the journey great great so you know all the best for your new book i wish all the Thank success you. and i think the book is available in amazon right currently yeah it's available in amazon also it's published from bpb publishers so bpb okay. is uh, bpb has their own website so it's also available there okay 
Cool. And and it's available in both the version, like uh, hard copy and the Kindle version. And Kindle, yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I generally read most of the books in Kindle. So yeah. Kindle. Would yeah, be it's, glad. it's easy to carry. Right. Yeah. So yeah, uh, in them, like I think now we can move to some of the recent advances in uh, the data science field. So uh, I I know like you have done a lot of innovation work, right? I know like you have filed nine patents, five of them got approved already. And also you have like more than 15 plus papers, right? So, uh, so how, what is kind of the motivation for you and how you can suggest others to keep track of this, uh, the recent advances in the data science field? So f first about the innovation, innovation is the necessity nowadays. Like if you don't innovate uh, mm. uh, in any ways, like it's not necessarily be a patent. Uh, uh, right. It's like, like the thought process. Like if you if you are not innovating or if you're not upgrading or upscaling yourself. Mm. Uh, so whenever you upscale, uh, like if I'm learning something new today. So today if I open my uh, my uh, Gmail, uh, I will see a lot of news, uh, newsletters. Mm. I, I, I subscribe a lot of news, newsletters. And definitely I will see two, three new things that I, I don't know right now. So I'll have to go through that. Right. So the things, the thing is, uh, if, if you can't upgrade or upscale yourself, uh, you, you will, it will be like extinct in this data science or AI journey. So if you are not, not a person who is very uh, passionate about lifelong learning or something like, uh, you are not very family, very much familiar with uh, learning at, um, at your mid career or later stage of your career, right. then probably the AI field um, may not be suitable for you. But right. I don't, uh, so that, that's what I feel. It will have to put much effort on upskilling, and uh, and that's that's also interesting that you that you said at the very beginning of this session that uh, this is what uh, makes the uh, field very interesting. Right. So 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 there comes the innovation. Like whenever you learn something new, then you then you start thinking that okay, I have this problem at my hand. Um, it's like you are working for some domain, be it uh, biology, be it life science, or be it uh, manufacturing, be it, oh. uh, you know, oil and gas, so whatever sector you're working on, uh, you have some problems in hand. And whenever you learn something new, uh, yeah. then you start thinking, okay, how can I solve the problem at hand with this newly learned thing? So then the innovation comes automatically, right? So you have some problem, you have, uh, you are thinking of some solution, then you tweak the solution, the existing thing, or you invent something new that, okay, uh, if I add this kind, new kind of activation function in my model, then this may uh, perform well. Or if I add uh, this uh, new kind of uh, loss function, then it may perform well. So right. that kind of thinking, uh, st that kind of, you know, understanding uh, starts popping up in, in your mind. Right. So if you structurally uh, convert those things into a paper or into innovation like patent filing then it's fine mm. uh, that's absolutely fine that's kind of a documentation of what you have done right. uh, but not necessarily that, that's not necessary all the time so if, if you if you are coming up with some new solution or if you are implementing that in the, in your day-to-day -day job so that's also innovation so for innovation you will have to learn so it's a daily learning process it's a lifelong learning process so you'll have to do you will have to keep on doing these things so that's right. how the innovation comes you have some some problem at hand and you have some knowledge so just connect them Season. right right so mainly it's about the experimentation and then like yeah. uh, creating a documentation out of those experimentation yeah the experimentation will come from uh, going through different resources and with the with our daily to daily work and the knowledge right so otherwise like we will be doomed <laughs> if we yeah. don't like <laughs> learn and, yeah. and that thing right yes so uh, and not only for AI, I think this is true for any field. Uh, right. Even if you are in some field that you, you are in manufacturing, you are in banking, you are in uh, medical science, so wherever you are, if uh, lifelong learning is something that you must adhere to, like uh, you cannot escape that. Right. Great. Yeah, you know, I think like we covered a lot of topics, like started with like basic data science, then you talk, talked about your book and also the recent conversation about like the research area, right? Or the innovation yeah. work which you did. Now uh, for our uh, listeners, right? So what tools and techniques you suggest they should uh, learn currently to be like relevant to this data science field, like diver changing data science field, right? Yeah. Techniques, um, 
Python is definitely the tool that you'll have to learn something. Like if you're not um, from Python background or if you mm. don't know Python. So for, for AI uh, for our data science, you must know Python nowadays. And mm. uh, you can also start uh, using Jupyter uh, Notebook as your development environment. Uh, uh, but once you are familiar with Python and you are very much uh, confident in Python, you can also uh, shift to some other um, IDEs uh, as per your choice, but you can start with Jupyter. So that is uh, easy to handle the code and right. for debugging purpose, you can start with. And uh, for Python, uh, the basic Python uh, you should know. And apart from that, you also have to know its libraries, like uh, for base, for something like uh, NumPy, Pandas, uh, right. uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, right? So whatever, whatever uh, you, you choose, uh, just start, um, start from that library and learn the basic functions that it provides. Uh, you should learn that uh, even if you do not recall everything, every function that uh, maybe the pandas provides or numpy hmm. provides at least you should know that what you can do with numpies because whenever the scenarios come you can just quickly do a google search and uh, stack overflow and can uh, get the syntax right. and all uh, but at least uh, even chat gpt also right even in chat gpt yeah <laughs> yeah it can it can be your uh, it, it guiding can company you while coding right yeah. right uh, but at least you should know that what it can, uh, what NumPy can do or what uh, TensorFlow can do. And um, some basic stuff, uh, the more you code, uh, some basic stuff, basic functions will automatically be in your mind. Uh, okay, you don't have to do Google search for that. Uh, but some uh, rarely used functions, uh, or, uh, some advanced functions. For that purpose, you may need to do Google search or uh, chat GPT search, but uh, that's fine. Uh, but uh, start learning these things. Um, so these are the basic things uh, that will definitely uh, you will have to know before right. you, or why, while you are working on AI. Right. And I also feel like uh, in case until and unless you know the very basics, your search won't be also optimized. Like you will take a right. lot of time to search yes. and find out the things. And in our daily to daily work, time is a very crucial thing, right? If you don't right. know what to search and how to frame the question, then that can be yes. a problem right yeah okay yeah. it's 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 very essential <laughs> right so uh, talking about the research right we are already talking about uh, so much about innovation and research what do you feel like what would be the biggest research area in in like next few years or down the line mm -hmm. so why i'm asking you this question is because you have done a lot of effort you have put in a lot of effort to come up with new research things and you are mostly mostly updated on this field so that's why this question to you yeah thanks uh so research, regarding research there are many uh, parallel paths which are running currently but uh, mostly the talk of the town is natural language processing because of the large language models um large language models uh, they started uh, for working on natural texts, but it's no longer only on natural texts because there are uh, diffuser models also that are uh, developed for image data or I would say computer vision in, in that sense. And uh, so next research, uh, the current researches uh, are moving towards multimodal AI. So if I have a large language model, can I talk to my image? Can I talk to my video? So multimodal AI will be very much uh, in for the research areas because a lot of, effort, lot of efforts uh, have been put by many organizations, many researchers uh, in this. So large language model is something that will definitely uh, attract more at attentions nowadays. Mm. And uh, then multimodal AI. Uh, vision part will also play a parallel role. Um, there are like, uh, especially for 3D, 3D rendering, 3D structure kind of stuff, the vision on 3D stuffs. Then another parallel path would be the graph neural networks. Uh, there are lots of graph data because of this interconnected society and the, right. and the you know, in the interconnected um, the, the, the shape is uh, like the graph. Some data has this kind of shape that you cannot convert it into natural yes. text or you cannot convert it into any any other unstructured shape. So it is the graph and you will have to uh, deal it in graph, in, in graph format. So graph neural network is another path. But most important, I think that you may have a lots of uh, vision model, big, big, big uh, LLMs and multimodal right. AI models. But the thing is, most important thing is the explainability and interpretability. So if your model right. is very much black, this neural network 
morals are very much black box but if right. it is not interpretable or explainable at all then there mm. is some problem in accepting that in industry so industry adaptation would be very slow uh, because you cannot rely your model you don't know how, how the model is thinking or how the model is inferring right so uh, a lot of effort will be put uh, for explainability then uh, ethical use of ai and th those areas and lastly uh, last but not the least is the domain specific applications of ai so you may have llm but how it can how uh, a transform model can be used in healthcare or in biology how right. it can be used in telecom or in astronomy data so those domain specific ai research will also flourish uh, it's all already on its ongoing process but uh, it will right. flourish yeah yeah so this right. is some of the areas i think uh, in near future we will see more traction yeah. right so uh, arindam like one question on this llm part right domain specific mm -hmm. so i mm -hmm. see like a lot of debate is going on whether we should fine-tune our model or we build a rack system and then kind of plug ask questions to the model and get the answer right so what's your take like whether fine tuning is better or the rack based approach is much more better mm -hmm. so i believe that it all depends on how much you can spend so more than the algorithm it's about the infrastructure that you have and of course your uh, uh, your business or if it is a very mission critical business and you don't want your data to be uh, sent to anyone so how we can choose those kind of parameters and then you can choose the best approach so regarding rag so what do we what, what i feel that lots of um, solutions are being developed where llms are backed by knowledge graphs so their uh, llms are uh, good in prediction but very bad in uh, you know extracting the factual knowledge that if i if i ask what is uh, 2 plus 2 so it will it will not see it as a unless and until it is uh, trained or developed for mathematical purpose the normal a basic language model a basic language model be transformer based or predictive um, any predictive model it will just predict the next best word Okay. Right. So it won't yeah. see it as a mathematical problem. It will say just uh, if I if I ask that uh, who is the uh, who is the CEO of uh, this company or that company. So this kind of factual knowledge, if it was not in the training data, so LLM will will not give the other right answer, and LLM will definitely give some answer. So most of the times it would be like hallucinations. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in, in that case, for factual knowledge, the knowledge graphs are good at factual knowledge. So you can um, amalgamate this, this, this two. You can. Um, it's like uh, uh, a relationship where LLM can help knowledge graphs, and knowledge graphs can help LLM. Okay. So that kind of yeah. uh, rag based system you can develop, uh, where you have LLM for generating the uh, generating the contents, and you have the um, KG backend for getting the factual data. Because right. Once you uh, there is a knowledge cutoff in LLM, so you cannot uh, retrain it easily. Again, you will have to retrain it with the new knowledge. Then it's a uh, uh, it's a difficult from the scratch. So there comes like if you if you really want to retrain with the new knowledge, you can do the fine tuning. Part. Part. So in fine tuning, yeah. you don't have to uh, put much effort on the, the end for the entire entire neural network. So you can just uh, upload, uh, update some of the some of the parts, and you can uh, go with that. So it's about the choice, like what kind of or how right. how much money you can put for training, and uh, what would be the easiest way for you for the use case. So you can choose that. Right. Yeah. So kind of an interesting topic, which you like talked about, like integrating the knowledge graph with the rag. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. one of the yeah. things like, which is very less explored also. I think that can be one of the things which people will work in the near future because every data is nowadays more or less graph in nature, right? Which you, yeah. which you already mentioned, like the graph neural network. Yeah, right. Sure. So very interesting perspective. So the last question, I think we are already close to one hour and it has been a quite interesting topic, but maybe we will do future sessions on that. But just yeah. to make it short, last question, what's your take on impact and issues of generative AI? Like, which is like the nowadays, everyone is talking about generative AI, right? But there are yeah. certain issues and uh, impact, which we also see. So what's your take on that? Generative AI is a fascinating thing. This is a very important uh, innovation uh, in in modern in modern age. It's not only for AI but uh, for everyone. Like generative AI is very important. Uh, 
innovation. So the positive thing is that it can easily reduce your cost in mundane tasks like uh, it can generate automation for many tasks you can if you want to generate something uh, quickly like a sim simple ppt or simple um, you know documents mm -hmm. or something like that so it can definitely improve your productivity okay and also it can help you for basic coding like uh, coding is something uh, like I, I want a login page for my website just quickly write that so the basic coding is definitely some that generative ai can help you or it can also help you to learn um, and uh, also for semantic search so you have lots of documents so if uh, generative ai can uh, extract something uh, from that document and can uh, show the output or if it can uh, also give the proper proper reference then for semantic search uh, kg is fine but one thing where it's very new thing you know the large language models uh, were not there five years back or 10 years mm. back so it's very very recent stuff right so um there are lots of ongoing researches that how we can reduce the cost or how we can improve the uh, trust and um, security right. So trust and reliability are some some big issues in generative AI. So uh, if if the content is uh, generated by the machine, so how reliable it is? Okay. Yeah. So how reliable it is for the production? In production, you will not have uh, the babysitter all the time. So uh, the, you will have to expose the model to the end users. And if the model cannot generate proper uh, conversational stuffs like if it is a hallucination you are doing some conversation with a machine and the machine forgets um, what was the topic when you started the conversation because conversation has become very large so right. it will hallucinate and will keep on generating wrong stuff so you know something which is meaningless so those kind of issues are there so researches are going on so maybe in near future we'll get uh, better uh, right. less hallucinated or in a better form of uh, large language models or generative AI. Then uh, security is another stuff. So whenever you're using something uh, for the, when you're interacting with the model, so model is also getting trained. So if you want to keep your model, uh, if you keep your training data at your premises or if you are allowing, allowing it to move to some other premises, so that's kind of security and uh, so how your your data might be uh, very important to you and it's a kind of uh, you, you might have your non disclosure ag agreement with your client but suddenly the client data went to LF. so lots of uh, things can happen and we have right. uh, seen some that kind of scenarios from even big companies so mm -hmm. security is something trust is something that definitely people will keep in mind while before using the generative ai then the cost and infrastructure cost that is also important because if you want to retrain your model from the scratch or if you're developing something from the scratch, then you will have to keep in mind the cost. Yep. It will. It, it may not be performed in a single GPU or just two GPUs like that. And uh, till now, it is not suitable for mission critical stuffs. So uh, you cannot just let the machine, the generative AI machine uh, handle some mission critical stuff. So, um, Till now, the babysitting is required, and uh, right. if uh, in, in near future, maybe we can come up with uh, better models, or, you know, better better ways to handle these things. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I also feel like whenever you use LLM in our day to day life, the mainly yeah. the one of the challenges is how you can evaluate that, right? So that's why the manual babysitting, which you mentioned, that is required. Yeah. Like, yeah, maybe like there are a few recent. I think saw a few of the recent. Uh, papers which talks about how you can evaluate the uh, using an LLM, another LLM output. Yeah, those type of thing is uh, quite essential. But yeah, uh, so in a quite nice discussion and uh, thoroughly enjoyed this time. And again, yeah, I enjoyed it too. Right. I, I wish you all the best with your new book, which is Pythonic AI, Thank you. which is uh, available in Amazon also. Like our viewers can go and, and check in Amazon and buy it if they want. I will also look forward to having a copy. So wish you all the sure. best. And uh, yeah, you. maybe we can have these sessions in future also. Nice discussion. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. for your time. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. bye.